and welcome to this webinar of the Jerusalem Press Club. I'm Uri Dromi. Today we are privileged to host Professor Ron Balitzer, founding director of the Research Institute at Klelit, uh, Israel's largest healthcare organization. Most relevant to our meeting today on the eve of a full close down in Israel, he's a senior member of the health ministry COVID-19 uh, team of experts. Uh, Professor Balitzer, thanks for taking the time to be with us. So we are facing a total close down from Friday uh, for at least three weeks. Uh, and that's pretty harsh measure. Uh, but exactly two months ago, you proposed an alternative plan which could have prevented it if adopted. Can you elaborate on this? Sure. Uh, I think uh, first and foremost, it is important to note uh, that we're not heading for a full lockdown. Um, we know what a full lockdown looks like. We've been there. Um, what we are planning on doing now when uh, this uh, policy will be enacted this coming Friday, um, let's say on, on Monday or, or Tuesday morning the next, most people will come up in the morning, uh, enter their car and go to work as usual. They will head to work and then they will go back home. And for that matter, this is by no means in no way uh, uh, a lockdown. People will also be able to get out of their house, have sportive activity, uh, not, not uh, treading too, too far from their home. That would be continued as usual. What is also restaurants will be open for take for, for deliveries and shops can be open if they uh, work with deliveries and any business um, that is not uh, dependent on having people come in and out uh, for, for frontal service will be open as usual. So, you know, in terms of the economy, this is by no means not even close to a lockdown. What we will be uh, seeing is that uh, most places of leisure activities, um, the, the uh, um, um, swimming pools, the gyms, the bars, the restaurants, um, um, will be closed to people coming in and spending time together in closed settings where they can most likely be infected to others. And we will also have the um, requirement for people to spend their time out of work at home as to prevent the social activities that are most likely to be associated with uh, infection. Uh, so no more weddings, no more events, no more uh, cultural activities, etc. So I hope by this I was able to, exp to explain that what we're doing here is something unique. It's not like the lockdowns you've seen somewhere else. It's more of a social leisure lockdown, if you'd like. So this is point number one that I'd like to take. And the reason we're doing it this way is because we need to strike a balance between the needs of the economy and the needs of public health. And we are trying to take the best out of each world um, in this dire condition that we were channeled into. Um, and we are trying to maintain as much as we can of the economy still working. And we are trying to prevent as much as we can of the, especially indoors uh, congregation that is associated with mass di dissemination of the disease. So uh, this is the concept of the, what you have just called lockdown. And I would say that uh, that's probably not a good, we need to find a new name for this because um, it, it, is, it is something very different. Now, in terms of how we got to this position, yes, indeed, um, you know, um, as I've said before, um, our success in containing the first wave was to our detriment. And we have at that point thought that we figured out some kind of formula, some kind of way that will be uh, continually uh, be staying with us and protect us uh, as we go along with this, the, the success of the first wave uh, containment. And that obviously was not the case. The virus, the virus never tires. Uh, it lurks in the darkness and waits for, for the opportunity. And once we have reopened the economy in a very rapid pace and without are looking back basically. So more and more activities were opened with not paying heed to the signs and signals of a uh, um, problematic trend that was beginning to ensue. And so the, the, those hints were heeded to too late and too uh, slowly. And uh, in various aspects, some limitations that were offered uh, by the Ministry of Health were uh, actually voted against. Uh, in, in the various uh, parliament committees and other, uh, um, um, you know, uh, um, 
bodies. Uh, yes, the the the, the relevant uh, uh, bodies uh, that are supposed to to basically be balancing the power and uh, helping uh, right decisions to be made. So many of these uh, uh, suggestions for limitations and you know uh, were were actually um, voted against, and so the economy was maintained more open than almost any other economy in the world, if you want to look at it. And so this was a very bold attempt to hold the stick on both sides um, and to be able to have a completely open economy and in parallel uh, uh, not pay a price in continuous dissemination. That did not work well. Um, and then the, the, the understanding has been uh, set, the infrastructure that was neglected or abandoned after the first wave because uh, we, we're be, began to re, be rebuilt, the contact tracing uh, process was restarted with uh, 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 new uh, vigor uh, with the collaboration of the Home Front Command, the Ministry of Health and other relevant uh, entities. And it is now in process of being uh, uh, you know, put into full uh, completion, uh, as well as uh, the lab test capability that was renewed with, with vigor. And the number of available tests is now growing dramatically, almost on a weekly basis. So one week we can do 20,000, the next week we can do 30,000, suddenly we do 40,000 tests per day. Um, you know, and, and it is continually increasing. And, and I, we will get to 50 and to 100,000 tests per day. Um, and so this is very impressive too, and it helps when you try to live with the disease. The last point that was put into place was, as you suggested, what we call the differential, geographic differential approach, which was said that you cannot have a, a uh, uh, um, containment measures or, or social distancing and economy disruption measures be equal in every part of the country. And you need to have differentiation by red zones, uh, orange zones, yellow and green. And this, this traffic light, uh, as it's called, uh, approach was put in place, uh, was suggested almost uh, over a month and a half ago. And it took some time to agree on every little point in that plan and put it into action. It was only put into action some two weeks ago. By that point, it was too late. By the point in which the traffic light approach was put into practice, it was too late. I, I feel you have a question to ask. Yes. Uh... I'll pick up on the last uh, point you made, uh, the traffic light. Uh, the idea raised by, uh, I believe, your team maybe, and uh, of course the Corona Tsar, uh, Roni Gamzu, was to, uh, to impose a lockdown on 40, some 40 uh, cities, mainly populated by uh, ultra-Orthodox and Arabs, but the plan failed, this differentiated plan failed because of political and, uh, and other pressures. Wasn't that the case? So uh, I would say that, you know, we can't know yet if it failed or not, because it didn't really have a chance um, to, to, to have its full impact. Um, the problem is that by the time we are able to go through the mechanics of getting a new set of limitations in, we already passed another thin line into the next stage. And those that uh, steps that were agreed and planned are already no longer sufficient and no longer relevant. And we have to immediately jump to the next set of recommendations, limitations, and steps. And, and I think the traffic light is a wonderful uh, appropriate and helpful system for living with coronavirus on the long term. Uh, the, the tackling COVID-19 is a marathon. It is not a sprint. There's nothing you can do for a month or two months that would make a difference. You have to uh, uh, um, plan for the long term. And the traffic light uh, idea is what will hold us steady on the long term. But that plan can work only when the uh, uh, level of infection is not as disseminated as it is right now. Right now, we're in a, in a, in a situation where uh, uh, over, you know, uh, um, some 3 million people live in red zones. Uh, you know, over a third of the country lives in red zones. If you add red and, and, and orange, that's over half of the country. And the whole, entire country is moving from green to red. So the whole idea of geographical differentiation loses its flavor, flavor when the level of dissemination is so, so dramatic. And so we, we really have to put that aside for a while. 
to get the flames under control because when the entire forest is burning, there's no point in, in, in you know, t targeted activities of putting down a fire here or there. You have to have a blanket uh, solution, uh, put down the flames and then deal with each one of these separately, both by the geographical approach and also by the uh, home front command alone uh, system for containing, tracing and testing. A uh, decision must be obviously uh, be taken based on facts, on data, but it seems that in our case, it's, it's a bit problematic. For example, last night, Prime Minister Netanyahu in a press conference just before taking off to Washington said that the number of uh, in Israel of severe patients is one of the lowest in the world. And today in the paper, we read that actually we have 54 per million compared to 44 in the US, 39 in Brazil, 22 in Spain, and two or three per million in Italy. So what's, what's going on here? I, uh, I cannot, you know, um, vouch for what he was intending to say, but I suspect that we, uh, the meaning was, uh, he was referring to the case fatality rate and not to the population mortality rate. Let me explain the difference. Uh, population mortality rate is the number of deceased people per uh, 100,000 or a million, which is what you have just cited, where Israel does not fare well because uh, our numbers are, are not low. They are, you know, around the uh, median and maybe even higher than that. So we're not doing very well there. Um, however, in terms of case fatality rate, the percentage of patients of, of, of you know, uh, tested positive uh, cases that are deceased uh, those numbers in Israel are lower probably than almost any other country in the world. We, we are very effective in keeping our patients alive. Uh, some of it have to do with the age structure, but above and beyond the age structure, it has to do with uh, keeping our older population relatively segregated uh, and, and they do not, a very small percentage proportion of the population infected are those within the risk groups. And finally, our hospitals are exceedingly ex uh, uh, effective in, in, in saving those people, in giving them the, the most intensive care possible. And this ability keeps our case fatality rate low and the numbers, you know, we are no, almost number one, maybe number one in the world in our uh, uh, morbidity, in the number of cases per million, but we're far from that in the number of deceased per million. This gap is because of what I've just said. And our biggest fear that led us to this uh, partial lockdown right now is our ability to keep our hospitals in, 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 in sufficiency that would allow them to maintain this gap, to continue giving the best possible treatment and saving as many of these patients so we don't have to go into even more uh, you know, aggressive steps than we did right now. And, and again, what we're doing now is we're keeping the economy running almost, you know, except for the hospitality and the restaurants to some extent, most of the economy will keep on working almost as, you know, not as usual, but to, to, to a very large extent. Right. Uh, two questions that just came in. One is, uh, what is your reaction to the claim made by many, including former Defense Minister Naftali Bennett, that the crisis should have been managed from day one by the Ministry of Defense, National Emergency authority uh, bodies uh, created specifically to deal with such a crisis. And also, uh, can you explain the gap between uh, the fact that Israel has so many successful med tech startups and uh, not so good uh, coronavirus results? Um, so starting with the first one, you know, it is very difficult to do the revolving, door, you know, the, the alternative hypothesis uh, assessment when, of what, what did not happen, uh, what is called to assess the counterfactual. What would have happened if that and that has happened, would it have been better? I, I can't tell right now. I can't tell if, you know, looking at the first wave and how it was handled, I think it was handled perfectly well by the Ministry of Health. The outcomes would, would uh, prove you know, uh, uh, that it was managed perfectly well. Um, whether or not from that point on, it should have been transferred to other hands, very difficult to say. What is clear to me is that the contact tracing effort that has been eventually delivered into the hands of uh, the Home Front Command in collaboration with the Ministry of Health is the way forward. 
the work together of these two entities together without the need to quarrel over authority and just getting the job done is what we needed from day one. I'm glad that once the, the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Ronnie Gamzu went into office, that was one of his first measures to say, you know, let's, let's, let's quit all of the discussion, that's it. It's gonna happen as a joint effort. And look, uh, you know, that, that's what is allowing us to have a decent exit strategy right now. Imagine what would have happened if that was not the case and we would have still not have executed that by now. So that part of the plan obviously should be in the hands of the Ministry of, of Defense <coughs> in collaboration with the Ministry of Health. So that is my response to that. Um, comparisons to other countries are tricky because of cultural and social uh, differences. I guess that close down in Taiwan, for example, works better than in Israel. Uh, do you think people will uh, comply with the, with the rules, especially when we are approaching the high holidays when, when uh, ultra-Orthodox and Orthodox want to pray together, etc.? Um, I, I do hope that now that the public understands how dire uh, the situation is, um, uh, people will comply with the uh, requests and recommendations and instructions, and uh, um, I, I, I suspect that they will. Um, I'm sure that there will be some examples of the contrary, but as a rule, I think that people understand the situation that we're in. I think people understand what is the meaning of 100 people losing their lives every week uh, for this awful uh, uh, disease. I think that nobody wants to be on, on that list and nobody wants their loved ones to be on that list. And so um, um, I do hope that the uh, awareness that has now dramatically ensued to the severeness of the situation would allow people to comply with the recommendations. Uh, in terms of enforcing and making sure this will happen, there are uh, uh, you know, people that are more educated on how to get this done than I am. And I'm sure they are taking care of it right now. Uh, question I asked you before, but uh, both of us forgot about it. Uh, can you reflect on the gap between the fact that there are so many mid uh, tech uh, startups in Israel and uh, relatively poor results in fighting the coronavirus? I think that um, um, some of our problems uh, uh, early on were hyper-centralization. So, uh, and I think the fact that, that not enough startup companies could get in the gap and have a true impact was associated. That being said, there's a lot of work being done by local startups uh, that is uh, uh, working in, in massive. We are working with many startups right now that are embedded in our care of, of COVID-19 uh, in the hospitals, in the community setting. We have working with one company on symptom checkers and we have another with another company on monitoring patients at home and another. So, so there's, there's a whole gamut of different companies that are involved in actual work. Uh, also the uh, internal innovation. So the Kladit Research Institute has created the famous uh, point-based model for assessing um, severity, um, you know, uh, risk, high risk patients, even if they're not within the elderly group. And those simulators and those tools put in the hands of the public helped us maintain such a low case fatality rate because of those uh, AI-based and, and point-based assessment methods. We have recently put into practice what is called uh, our coronometer, which is our uh, AI-based assessment for every patient, his a priori risk of being infected with COVID-19. And we send those patients in, in a proactive way for testing in order to find them early enough and be able to cut chains of transmission. So there's a lot of, of advanced uh, uh, tech being employed, much of the care that we provide is now being done remotely and, and so, but still, I think there's a gap. And if we had been as a country less centralized in later point of the, uh, uh, of, of the um, um, mitigation process, we might have been more successful in integrating them. What is the goal in the, of a number of infected people a day uh, during the, this semi-lockdown? Uh, you mean at the end of the tunnel? Yeah. So, so it hasn't been set yet, but uh, the government has requested such a goal to be set, and uh, and and uh, and they, these will be set in the coming days. But so I would in your, in your opinion, yet. in your opinion, I will. You know, uh, this is something for internal deliberation, and it will be eventually decided. Uh, what is clear, this number needs to be uh, in 
um, um, connected to the number of um, patients that the contact tracing uh, setting can address in a day. And I think they, they should be, uh, um, again, related one to each other. We should reach the point in which we can have a meaningful uh, transmission, uh, a chain cutting that is effective. And those numbers uh, must be considerably lower, more than an order of magnitude than where we are today. We're starting to get uh, reports that people, even when they recover from the COVID-19, they have some side effects, especially on the on the brain. Can you elaborate on that? So there's there's a whole concept of, of long COVID, as it's called, which is the long-term impact of the illness that is slowly being manifested. Some of it is clinical, and we know about it. People feel fatigue for a long time. Some have shortness of breath for a long time. Some have various neurological, cardiological, and other manifestations uh, um, that are uh, attributed to, to the long effects of COVID-19. The extent of these uh, is still uh, being deliberated, and there's studies that suggest that the percentage might be high, especially when we talk about general uh, symptoms like like fatigue and and uh, and the likes. Um, there's also data coming in from studies of MRIs of cardiac MRIs and other MRIs that suggest a a change uh, in again myocard in in the in the in the heart and potentially in the brain that could be manifesting itself later on with symptoms and signs. Uh, still, the jury is out. We're still collecting data to see how prevalent this is, but this is something that worries us very much. And one of the reasons we're trying to say that all of the ideas about, you know, let the disease roam freely and, and, and see what happens is not an appropriate uh, approach anywhere in the world. Also, amongst other reasons, because we do not still understand the implications of long COVID among those that were not seemingly severely ill. When you make recommendations to the decision makers, uh, you make them out of a pure health or medical prism, or you also take into the consideration the economic uh, aspects, including uh, effects on uh, public mental health, etc. Public health is a discipline that combines the every aspect of human life and its impact on your well-being. It is not only health. Well-being is, 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 is contained of many other aspects of, of mental health, of social health, of overall setting, um, um, other aspects that have a strong impact on, on, on uh, um, um, public health include poverty, include uh, stress, and so the impact of something such as lockdown goes above and beyond its impact on the economy. We are fully aware of that and we have did everything within our powers to delay or to negate the need to come back to this uh, very last step. And even when we have this step put into practice, we're trying to do it in the lightest way possible that would have the highest impact on the disease dissemination, but the least impact on, on both the economy, the ability of people to get to, to make a living. And we are calling for the government to make sure that this step would be associated with a strong uh, economical uh, um, um, compensation plan that would keep people, families, and businesses safe economically and would not cause a, an epidemic of poverty and, and the, the um, public health impact in, in parallel to helping us deal with the public health impact of the corona. What is called the economic corona is as dangerous as the virus itself, and it is also critical to, to tackle it. We are very much cognizant of that, and we are making every effort possible to delay and to negate some of those negative impacts of any step that we're taking to contain an, uh, uh, the disease dissemination. Uh... In a nutshell, how, how will this semi-lockdown be different from the other ones in terms of open spaces, Chola uh, Moed, you know, people will really want to go out, etc. So again, uh, in, the, in Passover, we were in what we call full lockdown, uh, okay, and for a long, so for quite a few days, every family to its own setting and nobody was allowed to go out, anybody except the exceedingly crucial workers on, on, on uh, uh, some of the most uh, um, uh, high uh, impact uh, factories, etc. Uh, other than that, people were at home. This is not the case here. As I've said, 
uh, following the uh, 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 weekend days and the, the, the holiday days, uh, people will go to work in many, many uh, different instances almost as usual. And they will come back in the evening and then they will not go to their bar or to the restaurant or to friends to have a large dinner together or to the, uh, if kids uh, will not go, uh, you know, to travel together to the shopping mall to hang out together. And it is obvious we are trying to prevent uh, congregations and we are trying to prevent social contact. And, you know, this is, a, this is the compromise that we've reached that would try to, to get what we need. This is not in any way very similar to what we've had in the past when we had full lockdowns. Uh, we promised to let you go after 30 minutes shop, so we're, we're going to wrap up. Uh, what about the pro protest rallies? Uh, should they not be prohibited as well? Because why is the right of people to protest superior to the right of people to pray? Because one is uh, uh, protected by law. Uh, the right for uh, to demonstrate is protected by law in Israel, and you know it is, um, and it's done so for a reason. Um, and so, whatever happens, the right to to demonstrate would be maintained and remained, uh, even in the most harsh conditions. I think it's critical to assure that. Uh, that being said, I'm sure there are ways in we can can appeal to these uh, protesters and ask them to be responsible. Uh, and to congregate in, in small groups, smaller groups, and to keep their masks on and their distance on, you can and you should demonstrate while uh, maintaining uh, the basic rules and, and uh, critical rules that would prevent people from being infected, despite the fact that, you know, infections are happening most uh, prominently in closed settings, uh, especially in, in, long, in, in longer time. The, the likelihood of being infected in the open air is, is you know, one order of magnitude probably smaller uh, than when you're doing the same type of activity in a closed, unaired uh, setting. So this is, I think, what I can say about that. Last question. Uh, what about air travel? What is your opinion? Uh, again, um, we, will, we, we have opened air travel in, in a very specific setting until now. What will happen in the uh, during this partial lockdown is something that is being uh, uh, deliberated today in a specialized committee that was put in for that. Uh, we will wait for their uh, judgment and then we'll, we'll be able to answer that. Professor Balitza, thanks for being with us and for your candid answers. I'd like to thank my able colleagues at JPC, Talia Dekel and Rachel Exiel. Stay tuned to our next events and Shana Tova to you and your families. <laughs>